everybody, Phantom here. Thank you for watching. Today, we are going to be talking about the Byford Dolphin Accident. Now, this is a tragedy that is said to rival or even be some type of precursor to the Ocean Gate Titan submersible accident that happened recently. This is a very interesting story, and I can guarantee you that it is not going to go the way that you think it is. So buckle up, Buttercup, because we're about to get into it. So this story first sort of begins by understanding what a saturation diver is. In short, a saturation diver is a professional deep sea diver who can descend to depths of 500 feet or greater. I'm not sure what that is in meters for all of you Europeans out there. Unfortunately, I'm American and I don't really know the metric system, so apologies for that. I'll try and edit and post what that would be in meters for you guys so you don't have to do the math. The reason saturation divers exist is that they are often supposed to uh, fix equipment on offshore oil rigs or adjust undersea pipelines. Basically, they are trained and designated divers who go to greater depths than commercial divers do, which means that in order for them to be effective at their job, they actually stay on site for up to 28 days, which is an astronomical amount of time in my opinion. And uh, let me tell you why this sounds like it would absolutely suck. So while commercial divers only do a job for like a few hours and then they're able to leave and go home, um, saturation divers don't get to have that privilege. Essentially what happens is they stay together for about 28 days. I think this is the, the like legal maximum that they are allowed to do a job. And this whole time they go really, really far down in the ocean. They do whatever job it is that they're supposed to do. They come back up and then stay together in a very cramped small space that is like essentially a pressure chamber, which I'll get into later. But they basically spend all of their time together in very claustrophobic tight spaces on top of being underwater together at like astronomical depths, depths in the ocean that I can't even fathom or like physically comprehend. So this to me is insane and I would never ever ever do this job. But for those of you who are curious, you can get paid between $30,000 and $45,000 a month if you are a saturation diver. Now I went ahead and did the math for you guys and that would be between $360,000 and then $540,000 a year. Uh, while this seems like an astronomical amount of money for a diving job, uh, you have to take into account the dangers of the job. Uh, for one, when you are a diver or you do anything in the ocean, there is always a chance of drowning. For any diver, all it takes is basically a minor fail of equipment and it's lights out like you're gonna drown in some cases. That's not necessarily the case. You can get help, you can be saved, especially if you have like a partner and things like that. But when you are a saturation diver who is 500 feet below the surface, if you have an equipment failure and like your oxygen leaks or something like that, I mean, there's nobody's really gonna be able to get to you in time to help you out. So there's hazard pay there in and of itself. Additionally, like I said, saturation divers have to stay in a cramped environment for nearly a month at a time. So not only is it a physically demanding job, but a mentally demanding job because you are stuck with the same people day in and day out, hundreds of feet below the surface, as I mentioned before. And that to me is extremely mentally draining. I myself can't imagine surviving an environment like that. I would rip my hair out and probably die from a panic attack because I like my space. I like being able to roam and go wherever it is that I want at any given moment instead of staying in a little room where I'm just constantly talking to the same people. And, you know, to me, it doesn't seem all that different than like a madman cell where you're just stuck in there day in, day out, pooping, and peeing in the same spot, you know? To me, I couldn't do it. Couldn't give me enough money. I don't care about the $540,000 a year, not happening on my end. Aside from the mental toll, there's also a very real possibility that saturation divers can get something called the bends. Now, for those who don't know, the bends is a colloquial term for guarding nitrogen bubbles in your bloodstream, and this happens when a diver surfaces too quickly. When a diver descends to great depths, the pressure in and around their body increases exponentially, including uh, like the organs, your, your like external limbs, but also all of the chemicals and gases in your body. They also fall under that pressure. So in order to properly compensate for this, and because of the pressure, the body has to diffuse gases like nitrogen, which are often in the lungs. 
Now, the way that this is diffused is by moving the excess hydrogen in your lungs to your bloodstream, because there's a lot more like room in the rest of your body than just in your lungs. So when a diver lessens the pressure that they are experiencing too fast, such as ascending too fast, the nitrogen that is now in the bloodstream that's not usually there expands rapidly, creating these big old bubbles, like actual bubbles in your bloodstream. And it's incredibly painful. The symptoms of the bends are excruciating joint and muscle pain, delirium, paralysis, heart attacks, and strokes, which all sound absolutely horrendous. And that's probably why I will never go diving. As cool as that sounds, I just don't really want to put myself in a situation where I could get the bends and have a stroke and die. Thankfully, though, if you do catch the bends early enough, it's not fatal. But like I said, it's going to be extremely painful either way. I mean, the only way to really cure the bends is basically taking whoever has it, shoving them back in a pressure chamber, putting the pressure back on them so that it recondenses like the bubbles in their blood, and then slowly easing them out of the, the pressure back to normal pressures, like if you're walking around on a sidewalk or whatever, and then that way your body adjusts normally as it should have in the first place. A big ordeal, probably incredibly expensive, and I can't imagine the medical bill that that would be. But this all brings me to the very unfortunate tragedy of the Biford Dolphin incident. So on November 5th, 1983, the decompression process for a series of saturation divers was underway. Um, while recreational divers simply make a slow ascent back to the surface is actually a lot more comp like complex for saturation divers to avoid the bends while commercial divers can get it just by coming up too fast like it's it listen it's i'm getting into it i'm gonna tell you what it, it's it's a very arduous arduous process because i mean these people are so far deep into the ocean's butthole it's ridiculous so essentially, to keep a saturation diver healthy, a pressurized shuttle moves them back and forth between the job site underwater and then the surface, where the divers stay in, like I mentioned earlier, a small pressurized chamber. So these shuttles are called diving bells, and between the diving bells and their pressurized sleeping quarters, saturation divers are at a constant state of internal and external pressure. This is so that they have, like, a complete and total equilibrium because the transition between domestic life and work life would take days essentially what's supposed to happen is that depending on how far down you go you have to have a certain number of hours of decompression so if they're constantly bringing people down and then having them sit in pressurized chamber for like five days just to bring them down again for another day's of work like it's super expensive and nothing really gets done so they do this process instead where they're constantly at a state of equilibrium with the pressure in their body. And then basically that way they can get the full 20 days of work in. Um, the last week though, like the last week of the 28 days is specifically for properly like decompressing and bringing the divers back to a normal state of pressure. So it takes a very long time is essentially what I'm getting at. And so the best way to like expedite the process and get the most work out of saturation divers is to just keep them at a very high pressure no matter what. If they're eating, sleeping, pooping, peeing, it doesn't matter what it is, they're going to do it at a specific pressure. Unfortunately, due to the delicate nature of this process, an entire crew is tasked with keeping saturation divers alive. The diving bell is gotta be in working order if it's not then the divers die uh, the pressure chambers have to be at the accurate pressure because if not they can get the bends and then the saturation divers could die so you're starting to see hopefully why one the salary is as high as it is and two why this is such a dangerous job um and honestly one of the most important jobs is that of the tender um because they tend to the saturation divers these people are called tenders I immediately thought of chicken tenders when I read this. It's nothing to do with chicken tenders. So tenders are individuals who unspool and retract the umbilical cord of the diving bell that transports the saturation divers back and forth. And the umbilical cord is made up of communication wires, air supply tubes, and other electrical wires. 
Essentially, without it, the divers wouldn't be able to communicate with anybody on the surface at all. So it's absolutely necessary that this umbilical cord doesn't get tangled up and is actually in working order. So in 1983, as I mentioned before, there was a tender named William Crammond who was at work on the Bifur Dolphin. Uh, this was like an off-site, semi-submerged oil rig. And he was completing a routine like normal. Like I said, he was extremely experienced in what he was doing. Things were expected to go smoothly. Um, at this time, William was tending to two pressurized living chambers, and as he moved the diving bell into position, William managed to successfully transfer two divers from the diving bell into chamber one after previously putting two divers into chamber two of the pressurized living chambers. So with a successful transfer, the living chambers were supposed to be sealed before the diving bell was released. Unfortunately, the diving bell detached long before the living chamber doors were properly sealed and closed. This led to something called explosive decompression, where the change from extreme pressure to normal pressure occurred so rapidly and all at once that it's essentially just an explosion. Documents state that the living chambers that these four divers were in went from nine atmospheres of pressure to an instantaneous one atmosphere of pressure. Because of this, nitrogen bubbles in three of the divers' blood expanded so rapidly and without warning that it effectively boiled the men from the inside out. That's how fast the gas reacted and how fast the pressure like shifted. It's I can't even like properly describe how instantaneous this was. And thankfully, the men died quickly. Like, they died instantly, so they didn't have to suffer, which I'm very thankful for because I can't imagine feeling what it's like to boil from the inside out. Like, that to me sounds like a horrendous form of torture, and I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. So, in autopsies for the three men that uh, had their blood boiled, it's reported that massive amounts of fat precipitated out of their bloodstream because their bodies got so hot internally and then the fat ended up clogging their heart, their liver, their veins, and their arteries. Meaning that all of their very important organs were basically just congealed fat at that point. Which is very hard to come to terms with and kind of understand what that would look like. Um, these three victims of the boiling were Edwin Arthur Coward, Roy P. Lucas, and Bjorn Bergerson. You may be asking yourself, hey, like, what happened to the fourth diver? Well, I'll get to that. First, we have to talk about William Crammond. So as this occurred, as the instantaneous, like, pressure drop happened and the diving bell, like, ejected itself off of the living chambers, William Crammond was killed by the diving bell because it went flying from the massive release of pressure. So he was killed instantaneously. Additionally, a colleague of Crammond's who was also there, a fellow tender named Martin Sanders, was critically injured. He did not die. And now we get to the fourth diver. Um, I'm not even going to lie, this is going to be very graphic. Um, so if you need to click away, I don't blame you. You can definitely do that. Um, there are pictures online that show what this man's body looked like after the incident. I'm not going to put those pictures in this video because... Uh, it's YouTube and that'd be a very bad idea but I will do my best to kind of describe what happened to him but if you want to go look up the autopsy reports and the autopsy pictures of these divers they are available all it takes is a little Google search fourth diver in the living chambers had in my opinion the most gruesome death out of all of the fatalities so diver trolls Helovic was reportedly standing in front of one of the doors of the living chamber when the accident occurred. Uh, the pressure that was released and sucked out of the living chambers was so great that it drug his body through a hole so small that it just completely tore him open and eviscerated him. Due to this, his internal organs were ejected onto the deck of the oil rig uh, up to 30 feet away. That is how violent the pressure release was. It literally sucked this man's insides out. If you look at the picture of his body, 
uh, almost all of his limbs, I think all of his limbs, are completely severed. I believe he was completely and totally decapitated. The hole, I believe, was about the size of a porthole, if I am correct. I can't remember off the top of my head when I was researching this and looking at the pictures, but it was a very small hole, and he was not a small man, and yet his body was forced through that. I mean, we're talking like round peg square hole type of thing. It's it's bad. It is very, very bad. Um, so because of this, there were a lot of problems that ensued. Given the large amount of death, violence, and overall gruesome nature of the accident, relatives of the divers pushed for an investigation into the incident. They wanted to know what happened, like what caused the accident to occur. Was it human error? Or was it machine error? Or was it both? Originally, people were very hesitant and resistant to do any of this because surprise, capitalism, things like that. Um, eventually, though, it was revealed that the accident happened due to human error on the part of William. In a usual operation, Cramen would have waited to vent air out of the living chambers once the interior door clamp was fastened, which means that it would have effectively sealed the living chambers from the outside world, and then Cramen would release the diving bell. And then once the diving bell was released, he would slowly release pressure and air out of the living chambers until it matched what it was supposed to match. That way the divers don't get the bends and they're kept at that equilibrium as I discussed earlier. Helovic was in charge of getting the clamp fastened, sealing the door. However, Helovic had not positioned the clamp before Cramen decided to vent air from the living chambers. Because he released pressure in the living chambers, this caused the diving bell to release itself early and thus the explosive decompression occurred. While it was decided that the incident was due to human error, further investigation led to even more damning evidence that it was more than just human error. The North Sea Divers Alliance alleged that the Biford Dolphin had intentionally been given outdated and obsolete equipment. Now this isn't the oil rig itself being at fault for the equipment that they had, this is just what was provided to them by the higher ups. So this equipment reportedly lacked proper safety features, meaning that even without human error on Cramden's part, or Cramden's part, there was still a strong likelihood that a similar accident would have happened in time. Essentially, it was almost inevitable. It wasn't like a if it would happen, it was a when would it happen sort of situation. And despite this controversy and the deaths of five men, the four divers, and then Cramond himself, it wasn't until 2008 that the Norwegian government conceded to the allegations and awarded family members of the divers appropriate compensation for the accident. So these people had to fight for 25 years, I think, to actually get any sort of compensation and like legal representation for what happened to their loved ones, which in my opinion is egregious and should never happen. And I just, I can't imagine what they had to go through and the expenses of trying to fight this battle in order to get compensation for what happened. Because of this concession from the Norwegian government and the tragedy that took place, safer diving practices and safer technology were implemented to prevent future tragedies of that caliber. New procedures have also been created to minimize the problem of human error. Unfortunately, human error is always going to be a thing, same with machine error. Thankfully, these procedures are designed to be redundant and essentially mitigate either a machine act, like messing up or a human messing up. There's basically a built-in a fail-safe system, like a checks and balance system, kind of like in the government. Um, how well that'll end up working, we'll have to find out. But so far, it seems to be doing pretty well thing that sucks most about this is that such a grotesque accident had to occur for the safety of divers to actually become a priority and to this day this is something that happens repeatedly where people don't care until something has happened and that to me is really sad and kind of disheartening I mean don't get me wrong I am glad that changes were made i just genuinely hate that it took the death of five people for anyone to actually give a crap then again we're also talking about the oil industry 
And at that point, like, I guess you can just chalk it up to, well, what do you expect? It's the oil industry, which is true because the oil industry as a whole is very much a predatory practice. Um, There's been numerous instances where the oil industry has promised to use technology that's been designed for like clean energy bought it out and then just never actually given it to people to reproduce it's a, it's a whole thing i'm not going to get into it that's like basically a different video but again it's it's the oil companies however um i do think that there is some solace in this in the fact that families of the divers did finally receive justice and did finally receive compensation I just genuinely hope that no future accidents like this will occur and that we will actually prioritize and take care of people like saturation divers because they do a very dangerous job that many people aren't capable of doing. I myself being one of them. Like I said earlier, you will not catch me being a saturation diver no matter how much that you pay me. These are very brave people and in a certain way I think they're kind of heroic because you know, it takes a lot of guts and a lot of balls to be doing what they're doing. But um, unfortunately, the five victims, uh, may they rest in peace. That is going to be it for the video today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this content, please consider leaving a like, a comment, and subscribing. It really, really helps. I love doing stuff like this and just learning new things and hopefully spreading a little bit of awareness on certain instances, for instance, diver safety. Um, please just share this video with your friends. Let me know what you think. And if there's anything that you want me to research in particular, please let me know down in the comments and I will definitely look into it and see if I can cook up a video on that topic for you that will suit your interest. Thank you again for watching and I'll see all of you guys in the next video.